This is the first note set for uh, Unit 2, which is about the molecules of cells. Uh, the molecules of cells include lots of different things. Generally speaking, they're made of carbon. Okay? The backbone of the, of the, set, of the molecules that are most often used by cells are made of carbon. Uh, carbon compounds are called organic compounds. And most of the molecules that cells make and use are based on carbon. Uh, there are a lot of unique properties that carbon has um, that allow it to make large and complex molecules. First of all, we learned in the last unit that it completes its outer shell by sharing electrons with the four covalent bonds. This is, this is um, more characteristic of carbon than it is on a lot of other elements because carbon almost always forms covalent bonds. Um, carbon atoms can covalently bond to each other or to other, ad other numerous other atoms as well. Um, the really cool thing about what carbon does when it bonds with each other is it can make long chains, it can make rings, various other kinds of structures, and the structure uh, causes the molecules to have different kinds of functions depending on what they're doing. Lots of easy bonding occurs with carbon compounds. Very, very versatile. Uh, organic compounds that are made of only carbon and hydrogen are called hydrocarbons. These are fuels like methane or gasoline, things like that. Um, and we often illustrate these molecules in a couple of different ways. One way is by means of the structural formula, like we see right here. The structural formula shows us the central carbon atom, and then each one of these lines stands for one covalent bond, or one shared pair of electrons between the carbon atom and the other atom that is present there. Another uh, model that you would sometimes see is a ball and stick model. If you had models to put together, like uh, Tinker Toys, you could put it together like this with the central carbon atom. And this shows the relative geometric relationship of the atoms to each other. And then finally, we have a space filling model that shows the space that would be filled by the electron cloud in the, um, molecule, the atoms that are present in the molecule. Um, in methane, this particular um, substance here, the four single bonds point to the corners of a tetrahedron, so that shows us a three-dimensional geometric shape. Most of the time, we're going to be dealing with, uh, with structural formulas like this and use the structural formulas to determine um, molecular formulas. Carbon compounds can have the same formula but be shaped differently or, or arranged differently, and those are called isomers, okay? And the isomers uh, the arrangement of the atoms in the isomer affects how the compound reacts. Um, you can have, for instance, here in this in this um, example, you've got two different kinds of butane. You have butane that's just a chain, it's an unbranched chain, and then you have a branched chain that still has four carbons. It's in in the molecular formula is the same, but this one's called isobutane because of the way the the molecules are arranged with each other. Uh, Carbon can also form uh, double bonds with other carbon atoms or with other kinds of atoms as well. A double bond is two shared pairs of electrons, and that again differs or changes the function of the molecule. Here we have butene instead of butane. The difference here is that you've got a two big a double bond between these two carbons, and you're missing a couple of hydrogens because those bonding sites are taken up by sharing with the other carbon molecule. Carbon compounds can also call a uh, build rings. They can be arranged in a ring structure that is just carbon and hydrogen here, like we have cyclohexane, or you can have one that has a double bonds and various other structures attached, as in the benzene. Lots and lots of different variety of shapes of carbon compounds. It's extremely versatile in making compounds. Now, one thing that can change the function or the, the property of the carbon compound, it's going to depend on the size and shape of the carbon chain, but also on the groups of atoms that are attached to the chain. These, these groups are called functional groups. Most of the functional groups are polar, which makes them what we call hydrophilic. That means that they attract water. Um, they're also water-soluble. And um, the functional groups also affect the shape of the overall molecule because this, since these um, functional groups are usually polar, then they are going to in, be involved in various kinds of hydrogen bonding and other polar attractions or repulsions, depending on charges of adjacent atoms, adjacent molecules, adjacent compounds. There are a number of different functional groups. We're going to talk about six of them. Uh, four of them are more commonly referred to in biology than the, other, than the others. But here we have 
three of the three of the main uh, functional groups. The hydroxyl, the OH, is found in alcohol, such as the ethanol that's shown here. This is ethyl alcohol, um, and the functional group is the OH, the hydroxyl, hydroxyl or hydroxide ion. The second one is a carbonyl. A carbonyl is a carbon with a double bonded oxygen on it. If you find the carbonyl at the end of a chain, it forms a compound called an aldehyde, like formaldehyde, seen here, that is commonly used as a preservative for living tissue, for uh, formerly living tissue. If it's found in the middle of the chain, that forms a, a molecule called a ketone, and they have different functions. Uh, the third group is a carboxyl. A carboxyl is a COOH. This is what we call the organic acid group, or the carboxyl acid group. This uh, um, functional group acts as an acid. It gives up hydrogen ions, which makes it an acid, okay? So here we see a carboxylic acid with the carbon double bonded up to the oxygen and then the, and then the hydroxyl group on the other side of, it, of the carbon. Um, when it ionizes, it loses that hydrogen there, donates a hydrogen ion, and that's what produces the acidic component of this of these kind of compounds. We'll see carboxyls on things like amino acids, nucleic acids, fatty acids, and so forth. Other groups that are that are important functional groups include the amino group. Amino group is nitrogen with two hydrogens attached, okay? Um, it's called it's NH2. It acts as a base by picking up hydrogen ions like that, like bases do. So here we have an amine group and an ionized amine where it's got an additional hydrogen ion. This is, this is commonly found in amino acids and other kinds of amine compounds. The fifth functional group that's important in carbon compounds is the phosphate group, or PA, PO4. Uh, phos organic phosphates are involved in energy transfers. The molecule that's shown here is one that we commonly refer to in biology as ATP. It's the main energy transfer molecule that's found in living cells. So phosphates are really, really common in lots of things. You'll find lots of phosphates in various kinds of compounds, including nucleic acids. And the final group that we have listed here is the methyl group. Methyl group is basically methane with one of the hydrogens removed, and it's, it's an, an attached chain, side chain to some of these things. This is one of the ones that we show here uh, that is not polar. So it is not, it's less likely to be um, water soluble or hydrophilic. Now, small differences in functional groups can make huge differences in the way the, um, the molecules act. It can cause differences in body form, it can cause differences in behavior. Here we have two structural formulas that are very, very similar to each other. If you took one and laid it on top of the other one, they look very, very similar with the exception of the functional groups. This one up here is called estradiol, that is the um, um, chemical name for estrogen which is the female hormone. And in estradiol, we have the methyl group here and a hydroxyl group here and another hydroxyl group at this end. Testosterone, the male hormone, um, is very, very similar except for the presence of a methyl group here and a, a carbonyl group at this end rather than a hydroxyl group. So very slight differences in the structure cause major, major differences in the actions in the body and the, in the uh, functions and the structures that it causes to be formed. Very, very different, even though they look a lot alike. Now, there are four main classes of important organic compounds. There are carbohydrates, lipids or fats, proteins, and nucleic acids. All of these molecules are very, very large molecules. There's a term we use called macromolecules. They're also called polymers. The poly part means many, okay? And they're made up of many smaller molecules called monomers. Monomer is the single molecule. And um, they're very, very large molecules. We're gonna talk about each one of these classes of, of macromolecules in turn. Um, but let's talk about them in general at this point, okay? We're gonna talk about how they form those big, huge molecules. The monomers are joined together by a type of reaction called dehydration. Now you know from your own personal experience that dehydration means removing water from something. Unlinked monomers have a hydrogen at one end and a hydroxyl group at the other. When you join the monomers together, the hydrogen on one end of one monomer 
joins with the hydroxyl group at the end of the other mon uh, monomer, removing that water molecule and joining the monomers together, like the following slides will show. Okay, so here we have a short polymer, a few things that are attached together, and an unlinked monomer here. Notice that we've got a hydrogen and a hydroxyl group on the end of each, of each chain. If you take this hydroxyl group and this hydrogen group and remove them, you get a water molecule, and that will uh, open up a bonding site here on each of these other molecules and join them together to make a longer polymer. This is dehydration synthesis. It synthesizes or makes bigger molecules by removing water. Every time you add another bead to the chain, it's going to remove another water molecule. Now, it's also necessary sometimes for polymers to be broken down. This is what happens when you digest in your digestive process. You have to break down those bigger molecules into the smaller molecules that can be, then be used by cells to make the molecules that they need. The opposite of dehydration is hydrolysis. You're adding water to break down something. The hydro part means water, of course, and the lysis part means to break down. So when, when hydrolysis occurs, a hydrogen is added to the end of one monomer, and a hydroxyl group is added to the other end, and that's how they're separated out, similar to the, the uh, dehydration process, but in reverse. So here we have our, our uh, polymer with our various monomers that are attached to each other. If we add water, okay, that's gonna t the, this is going to split into a hydroxyl group, which will attach to one end, and the, hydro and the hydrogen, which will attach to the other end, and that will give us two separate chains of um, molecules. Now there are thousands upon thousands of different macromolecules that are made by cells from a relatively small number of components, 40 to 50 common components. There are a few rarer components, but most of them are pretty common. That Each organism is unique because each organism has its own set of molecules that are needed for it. The monomers are universal. They're used in all living things. The proteins that are found in your body are the, uh, made of the same parts, the same 20 amino acids as the proteins in a tree or a frog or a bacterium. The same small pieces go together to make the larger molecules. All right, that finishes the notes on part one, which is the basic carbon compounds. Um, be sure to complete the form that you, that you were given to complete to indicate that you have uh, taken your notes on this part and then you may go on to the next parts of the lesson.